are indeed honored to have with us today Professor Bertel Square for today's episode of CNS Inspire series which features people who have had decades of experience in health and development and how these learnings can shape the responses for sustainable development over the next decade. Professor Bertel Square is Director, Center for Applied Health Research and Delivery at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine an honorary consultant in infectious diseases and tropical medicine at the Royal Liverpool, Liverpool University Hospital. He has contributed to international health policy and practice through his role as past president of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease and through other positions in various international organizations. He has built up a program of multidisciplinary health services for tuberculosis more accessible to poor people in developing countries, including those affected by the HIV pandemic. He is also one of the key researchers involved with the short course, course treatment for multi-drug resistant tuberculosis or the STREAM study as it is well known. Professor Bertel, given your decades long experience, we don't want to call it a lifetime experience because we know there is more to come as yet. What have been some major game changers in the past decade in the field of lung health? First of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to come along and talk and for giving me that very, uh, very grandiose introduction. I feel a little humbled by it. In a, in a way, I think the biggest game changer for me, I think it won't be a surprise for you to learn, is the attention that we now see in this, in this movement on the perspective of poverty. In, in tuberculosis, both in terms of how patients access services and in terms of our response. And, it, and I think a, a great game changer now is the fact that the um, NTB strategy has a goal on reducing catastrophic costs for TB patients and, uh, and, and that, that sits alongside the epidemiological targets. And I think there's an increasing recognition that unless we address the suffering and the catastrophic costs, we actually won't hit the epidemiological targets of the NTB strategy. I think the other thing it, that is important is that in order to address those catastrophic costs, we actually have to address lung health more broadly. Um, and maybe even other aspects of, of care seeking. And I think that's a really, a really key thing. If I may say, I think another game changer, which I don't see getting any traction yet, is the recognition in recent years that tuberculosis is in many ways a male epidemic. In the last couple of years, we've had seen evidence from prevalence surveys for the first time showing that the ratio of male to female TB patients is you know around what two to one if you take a global estimate 1.6 men to one women it's not the same in every country and there are countries like Afghanistan where there are more women than than men affected but if you take the average it's in general a male epidemic and that links to a whole series of actions which I don't see us taking yet um, it's a complex piece to unpick, especially as there's also evidence that lost cases, missed cases, are more amongst the men than amongst the women. And I think this is a piece that we need to pick up. It relates again to the, the whole issue of catastrophic costs. There are, is a complex intersection between masculinity and the sense that people need, that men need to provide for households, which, which is one of the contributors to late presentations. And I think that in itself then leads to onward difficulties. What are some top actions governments and other stakeholders must take on lung health and neglected tropical diseases like schistosomiasis so that we can deliver on the promise of lung health and NTDs related SDGs like reducing premature mortality of, from NCDs by one third by 2030 and ending tuberculosis and NTDs by 2030? That's a tough question. It's a it's a broad it's a broad scope. I would divide my answer into two halves, if I may. Yes. Um, I think there are there are clearly things that the health system or health systems in general should really bring to the fore. Um, clearly, one of them is this issue of universal health coverage. That's going to be crucial across the board. Um, the second is, I think 
within health systems and in, an increasing momentum behind what I call applied health research, um, encompassing health systems research, operational research and implementation research. I do think that in the health sector we have a lot of momentum around the research needed for new tools and I think globally politicians and the public recognize that research will give us new things, new drugs, new diagnostics, new vaccines. I don't see much recognition that we need this applied health research in order to make systems work for patients. We need this, this applied health research to make sure that these new tools as they come off the line get into health systems in a way that it really works and goes to scale. And I think there's some work to do in getting that message across that applied health research is crucial. Um, I see lots of investment in new things, I see less investment in that and I think that's going to be really crucial. If we look outside of the health system and I think it's really important that we do look outside of the health system in this area of sustainable development goals, then I think we need to be in, in the world, in, the, uh, in these disease centred programs including the neglected tropical diseases and lung health we need to be recognizing that we should be looking at upstream influences on these diseases so examples would be we need to be reaching out to the the community that looks at air pollution and tobacco control these are these are big drivers of of the infectious diseases as well as big drivers of the coming non-communicable lung epidemic. Similarly we need to reach out for example with the with the neglected tropical diseases to the communities around water and sanitation. These are also big drivers. So I think in, in summary I think my answer is in two parts. We, we need to focus within the health systems on health systems research. I think there's a lot of momentum about around universal health coverage. But, in the, uh, but outside of the health system, we need to be focusing on reaching out and linking with those things that will really influence the, the drivers. And really top amongst them is, a, is the tobacco pandemic. I still think that is a, a thing that we haven't tackled in a, in a big way. Can you share some salient features of the stream study results which have come out just now? And because all eyes are on that study and <laughs> the sort of uh, over full room crowd you drew that day uh, in the presentation and what uh, would be its impact on the NTB strategy? Thank you. So I should start by saying that I'm a small part of the stream study. It obviously is a huge effort across across many and big, big, big recognition to the union and to the funders USAID and the UK government as well. Um, so I think I think it, the, the results of that trial are really a milestone. That it is the first time we've had a randomized controlled trial of a regimen for MDR-TB. And uh, that in itself, I think, is, a, is an achievement. The second thing I think that's very crucial about that trial is that it's the, one of the first times in TB that we've seen integrated within the trial um, studies on health systems and patient costs. And I think that's going to be very important in thinking about how to, how to implement and how to scale up. In terms of sharing the highlights, I think the big messages for me are that the big surprise to many is that the 20-month WHO regimen really performed well. We had an 82% uh, success rate there, which has never been achieved in, you know, not in very few places. But I think what it tells us is that if you implement really well and there is an important thing here under trial conditions there is a such a focus on doing things well it shows that that even with really tricky red long regimens you can achieve the other thing is i think that message then spills over into the short shortened regimen i think it's clear that in the shortened regimen there are complex clinical management issues that the regimen throws up including questions around ECG monitoring and other things, which will require a similar attention to detail to get the same results. So having said that, the, the next big headline I would give is that, as predicted, the costs of the shortened regimen to the health system are about a third what they would to the control arm. And also that patients themselves save save, not just in health seeking costs, but also in the speed with which they can return to work. And I think these are really crucial findings which help us interpret what many would see as, as a 
as a, an equivalent result, even though the stats didn't quite demonstrate that. So I think if, you, if you're faced as a policymaker with this question, should we, you know, we've got these two regimens which seemed in trial conditions to do relatively similar, so how do we make the decision? Well, I think we'd make the decision around things like benefits to patients and, and benefits to health systems, and I think those are going to come to the fore and will be, will be core. Um, in terms of how this will go towards the NTB strategy, I think it feeds into two very high-level concerns in the NTB strategy. F f you will, it will not be a surprise coming from my mouth that the fact that these, this could translate into patient savings is, is really crucial. But I think also the fact that we, we will be able to generate um, greater momentum about the provision for MDRTB is going to be very important for the NTB strategy. We currently have only one in five MDRTB cases actually accessing treatment at all. And that's largely because the control regimen requires such a lot of effort to get it up and going. So I think in the, in the short term, I, I hope we see countries really move forward and accelerate with implementing the shortened MDR regimen and making provision there. I hope that there is a, well I have a second hope, and that the savings that the health system makes from the shortened regimen are reinvested in the health system for prevention purposes. But I worry that we, in our effort to get uh, action on MDRTB, we forget that the biggest action on MDRTB is prevention. Mm. And I think if we can make the savings from the, the health system savings from the longer regimen and put them into our first line regimens and make sure that we're not generating TB, that we're looking at issues like infection control in congregate settings and hospitals and the like to make sure that we aren't generating new cases, that's going to be the real, the real game changer in my view. One of the interesting findings in terms from the patient perspective in the patient costings is that you might imagine if we hadn't done this study of the patient costs, mm -hmm. you might imagine that patients return to work sooner because they complete treatment sooner. Actually what we showed is that patients on the shortened regimen return to work sooner even while on treatment. So it wasn't just a, an accumulation of, of that time after completion of treatment, they were returning to work sooner during the time of the shortened regimen. And I think that's a crucial thing to take across. So it's, it's not just the shortening, there's something about yes. the regimen itself which has actually permitted people to go back to work earlier. And or, I think that's exactly as you say, important. You have been an inspiration to so many of us. Uh, when you look back to your several decades of your contribution to global health, what have been some of your moments of pride? I blush at the idea of being an inspiration and I, I, am on, I honestly don't feel that I have any particular moments of individual pride. To be honest, I feel enormous pride in having been a part of, and I think many people contributed to this, but at least I feel I've been a part of what has become a movement around addressing the poverty perspective in tuberculosis. That to me is a, I'm very proud to have been part of that, but I don't take credit for doing, you know, the lion's share. That, that to me is, is a, a moment of great pride. Um, the other thing is that, that in that process, I, it was a huge honor to serve the union as president and a huge honor to serve the union as president when it, it formulated its, form, its forward vision of health solutions for the poor. So those, those are my, those are really uh, important things to me. And the third thing that I, that I take pride in now, along with colleagues, is seeing a new generation of, of active uh, researchers, activists, community civil society really coming to the fore. When I started my work on tuberculosis 25 years ago, at, for example, at the School of Tropical Medicine in Liverpool, I was the only person who had a specific focus on tuberculosis. I now look around me and I see colleagues uh, in all the training grades 
who are really interested, and not just as medics like myself, but I see people interested from fields of social anthropology, from health economics, from modeling, from maths, from drug development, and they're young and enthusiastic, and they see this as a challenge that really needs to be met. And I find that a very inspiring thought for the future, that there is a new generation of people coming forward, and that they see this disease not as a biomedical issue alone, but they see it much more broadly. And that permits them to reach out to patients. Many of the colleagues in our teams have themselves been affected by tuberculosis. And I love the fact that we're seeing a breakdown in this dichotomy that people see, that somehow the health service is here and the patients are here. Actually, in the health service, at some point, all of us are patients. And, and I, don't, I like to see us as working together towards a, a, and I know people don't like the word patients. I, I feel it maybe affected community well, actually, the health community is itself affected by this disease. Healthcare workers are affected, and I, I love that breakdown of barriers in the, in the new generation. Well, uh, my next question was, what is your message to the new entrants <laughs> in the field of health and global health? What message would you like to convey to them? I've mostly articulated it the, in, the, in, in my previous answer. My message is, don't find yourself siloed in your own area. Don't find yourself working only in your discipline or only in your community. Make sure we reach out and that we combine and we, we look for collective ways to go forward. I think that's my big message. The second message is don't be faint-hearted. Tuberculosis has beaten the human population for such a long time. We need to be prepared to stick with this and really keep going. I think we have a huge opportunity right now um, for the first time with the UN General Assembly looking at, at this issue, with the Moscow meeting coming up. I think all of us from our different perspectives in TB, we have an obligation to get this talked about at every level. TB has so suffered from not being a, a natural topic of conversation in the way malaria is or, or, or HIV uh, or even maternal and newborn health or water and sanitation. You tell me tuberculosis is not a topic of conversation. And I think if we don't seize these, these next 18 months to winter next year, we're going to miss that opportunity to, to make that difference. Thank you very much. Friends, you were listening to Professor Bertel Square, who is globally known for his work in the field of public health and research. Thanks. Thank you.